Okay, this recording is for the Dixon Public Library's uh, Oral History Project. Uh, today I'm, I'm talking with uh, Gordon Marvin. My name is Paul Farrell. We're here in uh, Mr. Marvin's home here in Sacramento. Today is uh, July 2nd, 1998. And we're going to talk about Dixon, of course. Uh, Dixon back, back before World War II. But before we talk about Dixon, a uh, good idea to get some family history, whatever it is uh, you happen to remember. Uh, Great-grandparents, grandparents? No memory of uh, great-grandparents. I remember my grandparents quite well. My uh, grandmother's name was Annie, and my grandfather's name was William Rattenberry. The family name, I think it's uh, English or Canadian. Sent. Uh, my grandmother used to have a boarding house years and years ago. Uh, took in boarders, sleepers, and fixed the meals. And I remember going to her place and on special occasions, and the big cake were on the table. Uh, very fascinating. They're both gone now. Uh, most of my relatives are out in the Dixon Cemetery sad situation, but that's the way life is, I guess. Uh, my mother and father, uh, my father was born in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, Leo Marvin. My mother, Effie Rattenberry, was born in Dixon. And my father had a garage over there, one of five garages that uh, were in the area at the time. Used to store vehicles as well as fix them. Before people had garages on their houses, they would bring them into my dad's garage and store them by the month over there. Uh, I remember <laughs> helping during high school, helping in the garage with my jobs, wash and wax the cars and clean the spark plugs and face the valves and a few minor things like that. But, um, going through high school, uh, got into music. I did my first professional job, I guess you'd call it, uh, in 1935. I played when I was a junior in high school. We had a little band. Where would you play at? Oh, different functions. They used to have dance clubs and, uh, in the areas, in Vacaville and Davis and Dixon, sometimes over in Woodland. Uh, and uh, we were known as <laughs> The midshipmen, seven midshipmen. There were seven of you in the back? In the, at that time, yeah. What was Vernon Dutra a part of that? Uh, he wasn't part of the original band, but uh, that's when I was with a gentleman named Ben King. His father had an electric shop over in Dixon. Ben had hands as big as all outdoors. He played piano and I played drums. I wouldn't wish that on <laughs> my best enemy, drummer. Uh, then I started my own group. Uh, I joined the Bernie Bentz Band in Woodland in the late 30s. And we worked until the war started. Then we broke up because everybody went in service. We reformed after the war, 1946, I guess. And then uh, Bernie Bentz was the leader at that time from Woodland. He subsequently got sick and I took over his band. And I had the band for 20 years. Now you you played the piano in that I band. played the piano. I had moved into piano. I figured that uh, a drummer wasn't all that smart, had too much gear to carry around. So I got to be a leader and I got to carry all the stands and all the music around, so that was a trade-off. But um, I'm still working occasionally with, with different leaders in town that uh, need some piano help. But mostly uh, my recollection of high school, well, I did play in the band in high school. In I played room. double B-flat sousaphone. This thing goes round and round and comes out here. Uh -huh. 26 and a half pounds. I remember that to the day I die, that I had to carry that in parades down in Vallejo, up and down the hills. And 
What, what about the Mayfair? Did you did you walk in the parade? Uh, we always had a parade. My mother was a very beautiful woman, and she was made queen on several occasions. And she was also in 1915. They had a Pan Pacific Exposition in San Francisco, and she represented Solano County, Miss Solano County, in 1915 for the exposition. So uh, she was 18. Uh, I don't remember too many individual situations. Well, now, well, you were talking about your high school years, but um, what about your, your most earliest memories as a small child? Huh? What do you remember about Dixon? Well, when you're a small kid, uh, nothing is outstanding. I don't think, uh, I don't remember anything mm -hmm. as a dominating factor. Just remember that my dad had a garage and there were, in a little town like that there were five garages at one time and, and uh, I would help him with that. And it's funny, at the time my dad smoked Chesterfield cigarettes and I was able to go in and buy cigarettes for my father because they knew I didn't smoke but it was okay that I could go in 50 cents a, 50 cents a pack or two packs for 50 cents, I don't recall. But things like that, not all that important in life, but I, I do remember being able to buy cigarettes from my dad. Well, um, you know, Vernon, uh, Vernon, uh, he was, he was, Dutra, he was telling me that, uh, it's kind of a, I don't know, a rift between the, the city kids and the farm kids. He was a farm kid. And I he guess was you a were a city kid? A town I, kid. I, never, I, I didn't notice that. Now, uh -huh. why that would be, I because everybody came into Dixon. That was the high school, and, and I don't see there would be rifts between the Dixon kids and the Vacaville kids, or the Dixon kids and the Winters kids, or uh -huh. Dixon kids and Woodland kids. But uh, I don't remember that. It's well, funny that different different strokes for different folks, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. that stays with him, and I wasn't even aware of it. Uh, he was. Uh, he played some some sports. Uh, these, these rivalries between towns, I guess. Winter oh yeah, it was a lot. I think is a lot greater in those days than it, than it is now. Uh -huh. um, there, our whole student body. We might have had two or three hundred kids at the time. Maybe the, the football squad might be 20 kids at the most, or 25, I have no idea. Uh, and so everybody was, was behind them, rooting for them. So a football game must have been quite an event. Oh, yes. Football was, was big. green and white, I remember that. Just green and white comes on the field. Uh, that was our school colors. But, um, I, I didn't get into football too much, primarily. I was kind of worried about my hands, and I wasn't big enough, large enough, bulk-wise, to, to do anything. I think I made the second squad one year. <laughs> but it's a, it was a good sport. Anyway. Everything was, as far as I could tell, above board and honest, and nobody tried to pull any smart maneuvers. Sports have changed nowadays. Uh, it seems like winning is the name of the game. You know, you don't, how you win is immaterial. It's if you, you got to win the games. Uh, well, I guess uh, sports a big social event. Another big social event is dances, I guess. I talked with Margaret Jane Carpenter, uh -huh. Roar. She said she loved that. She said you had a pretty good band. Oh yeah, we had a nice band. We used to have, I remember noon dances. They had uh, certain times. I don't know whether it was once a week or Friday would be a, a noon dance, and they'd go to the gym and everybody do their thing. Now they played the radio for that. Uh, yes, uh, we didn't have live music at, during those. We did at the prom and the senior ball. I recall in the gymnasium at the old school. I remember the old school, they tore it down because they said it wasn't earthquake 
proof and it took them three and a half times as long to tear it down as they thought it would because it was so solid. <laughs> Look back on that and say, what a waste. Well, tell me about, uh, about school. Uh, how'd you like school? Average, you know, C, C minus, C plus once in a while. Nothing great. Music was the predominating factor. I was in the orchestra and I was in the, in the band and then uh, the glee club. It's funny, uh, you kind of set your sights on something early in life. I kept through that. I went, after I got out of high school, I went to junior college here in town music there for a couple of years. Oh, you said orchestra. Yeah. I, I never heard about that. So there was an orchestra at Dixon High School? Uh, yes. Mr. Merrill Good, I, I think his picture is in one of the chanticleers. That was our music instructor. I still remember him. Yeah, he had the marching band and we had a little orchestra besides that. Well, now let's see. You were born in 1919. Now I think I'm not mistaken, Prohibition started in 1920, or maybe it was 1919. I don't remember all that. Uh, uh -huh. My folks, as far as I can remember, did not drink. They weren't teetotalers, I don't think, but uh, I just don't recall seeing them drink. I don't know about my uncles and aunts and all that, but I had uh, my own family, my father and mother didn't drink, so, so I couldn't tell you much about Prohibition. Once again, you, you might be involved in it and not even know it. See, I don't know whether uh, I can't relate to anything prohibition wise. So. Well, I guess you could relate to, to cars uh, growing up around your father's garage. Oh, yes, in the garage. Yeah. But, uh, he had a, an agency at one time for the Graham Page. Uh, Later became Graham. It was three, three Graham brothers, and uh, they're long gone now. You know, gobbled up by somebody else. But, uh, we had uh, a dealership there for. Uh, Graham Page is a dealership. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you sold new cars. Uh huh. I uh, in our fiftieth uh, class reunion, I went back to the Tribune and and picked up some information of prices of various things during 1937. And as I recall, uh, a little Pontiac, it costs, I don't know, $780, something like that, brand new. Loaf of bread was a dime, maybe. Uh, there was one ad there in the, in the real estate section, had a farm and some outhouses and buildings and various, I don't know, the acreage. The whole thing was $5,000. So probably worth 500000 now, the same property. Uh, it seemed like so long ago. Yeah. Well, uh, what did the... Uh, what did you kids do for, for recreation when you're in high school besides uh, sports and sports. dance? Was there, was there, well, what about uh, movies and such? Was oh, they had the, the Dixon Theater building is still there. I don't think they're showing films anymore, but that was the movie house. There was one. Mm -hmm. They used to give away the, the uh, saucers and dishes and uh, my sister, won a little radio, portable radio at one time, I remember that. That was a big big occasion when you could win a radio. <laughs> so they would have contests every, what, Saturday no, night? No, just a drawing, you know. Drawing. So many people come in and a ticket number would uh, would be the winner, a certain ticket number would be the winner. So but, uh, they used to have that all the time. What, what about some... Uh, some of the other businesses, you, uh, you must remember some other stores and All such. Oh, uh, Dixon Drugstore. Mr. Kirby had the Dixon Drugstore. There was another drugstore that came in later on. Uh, Haberdashery was uh, La Fontaine. 
Mr. and Mrs. LaFontaine had the suits and dresses and the shoes and all that. It was the haberdashery. We had the two banks. We had a, a bank of Dixon, and I think it's First Northern now. And then they had the First National Bank. Either that or the First National is now First Northern. One post office, a couple of barber shops. I remember that. Dennis was two dentists. One was over the old post office building. Dr. Wrigley, and down by the church was Dr. Cumley. What about what about doctors? Uh, Dr. Doctor? Parsons. Now James Parsons uh, was one of our classmates. His father was a doctor. Francis Stolle was one of our classmates. His father was. Parsons still lives in Carolina someplace. Does Francis Stollard live in Dixon? I thought he might still live there. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I look at uh, look at our Chanticleer of 1937, and goodness sakes, a lot of the folks are gone, unable to locate. Still a few of the hardcore left, I guess. And you'd probably be in a position to know that better than me. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few still left. I, I guess the population was around 2,000? It's It seems like that, 1,500, 2,000 at the time. One block of Main Street, that was it. The American Legion Hall was there, I recall. And, uh, a couple of grocery stores. A fellow by the name of Mitchell had uh, had a grocery store. Not too much other than that. Service station, standard station, there was a shell station. I'm going to talk to Tig Thompson tomorrow. I think he owned the shell station. Yes, yes, yes. Tig is. Do you didn't know he was still around? Always oh, still around. He was mentioning that the parade would. Mayfair Parade would go right by his, his mm -hmm. station there. They'd go clear on down to the fairgrounds. The fairgrounds were south of town, and, and his his uh, he was on the main street at uh, at A Street. We lived on West A, which was across the tracks uh, going west. Well, what do you remember about the Mayfair uh, celebration? What was that like? Uh. I just don't remember that much other than they had the carnival there and that's the thing that the kids are usually interested in, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I was uh, familiar with the uh, the uh, Portuguese people had a Holy Ghost celebration there every year, which was a, a big deal. I think it was in July or August of every year. Yeah, Vernon mentioned that. Yes. That, that was a parade and... Uh, not so much the parade, they had it uh, at the uh, in the fairgrounds and uh, they would have a series of dances. Uh, the reason I know is they would have a Saturday night dance and a Sunday afternoon dance and, and that was always a big thing. And we did have, as far as the ethnic division, we had a lot of the Portuguese people were farmers. Any uh, African Americans there at all? No Germans. They, they make up had some the Oriental, had some Japanese and uh, Chinese. But, uh, I never heard about that. What what sort of business were most of the Japanese and Chinese? Well, one of the Japanese people had some law had a big laundry there. Uh, the building is no longer there. But, uh, right across. From our place, our house used to be located at Adams and A Street, and it comes the highway through the front yard, so we moved the house, turned it around, and moved it into our backyard. Subsequently, it's been demolished, and that little market is there, I don't know, a little quick sell, I don't know, if it's AM, PM, or one of those fast markets is on our property. Back in the 30s, she had bought this six and a half acres 
west of town had it subdivided. She had 36 lots, I think. And uh, tried to develop it. City Hall just fought her the whole way, but uh, finally got it developed. Had to give the lots away almost to move them, but uh, she finally got rid of all them. Got some houses. Pegard Avenue and Marvin Way is a, is a development there on the west side. Oh, you were saying, uh, of course, I know what the Marvin Way is named after, but you the said family. Pegard? Pegard? Pegord. Pegord. My sister's name was Peggy, and mine was Gordon, so. Oh, I see. Peggy and Gordon. Mm -hmm. Pegord. Oh, I got it now. So we had one block of Pegard Avenue and then a couple of blocks of Marvin Way. Our claim to fame, I guess. Uh, did, did your mother come up with these names? Or? I guess so. I, I don't recall uh, how it happened. It's a good name. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to go back on what, what you said about your, your grandmother had a, a, a boarding house. Yes. What? Uh, what exactly is a rooming house? The same it's thing a rooming as a house, house. Yeah, room and board. Uh, Downstairs, there was the cooking facilities and all that. And upstairs, she'd have several rooms for sleeping rooms. Mm -hmm. and she'd serve the meals. I remember the smells that would come out of that place. And, uh, she had that for quite a while. That was that was downtown somewhere, Dixon. Uh, I can't think of the street now. It was Midtown, but it was uh, towards uh, the northern. know if the house is still there. I haven't been over there for so long. Well, you were you were uh, in town, but uh, all around you were, were farms, all around Dixon. Yes. yes. Farms. So that must have had a big influence on Dixon, I guess. Yeah. So I guess it still does. Well, this is probably known as a bedroom town now for some of the, the larger cities, but uh, used to be uh, the hub of, of the agriculture over here. And they had, uh, I'm trying to think, grain, I think I remember next to my dad's garage, and it was right by the railroad tracks on A Street. My grandfather, before they had bells and whistles to let the gates down and all that, they had manual gatemen, they would call them was up on a, on a uh, little room up built on stilts, and uh, when the trains would be coming down the line, he would pump the gates down. And then when the train went by, he'd pump the gates back up again. And they had two of those, one on each side of town. And I remember my grandfather worked there. That was his, his job, gate entry, I guess it was Southern Pacific. My father's garage was right across the street from that, right by the tracks. And there was a big grain warehouse between his garage and the tracks. Mm -hmm. These farmers had come in you know, a lot of times with their, their horse and, and wagons, with, uh, and everything was in sacks, 100 pound sacks. And they would sack that stuff in, come in from out of town and put it in there, and probably weigh it. And all done manually. Tough job, dirty job. Your father's uh, business was was a garage. I wonder if uh, did did farmers come in with a with a tractor or did he ever work Not on so farm much the tractor. He had a gas pump. He would uh, Red Crown gasoline prior to Standard Oil uh, was the, the gas. And I remember they would the, these gas wars would come on. Even in those days, and gas would go down to nine and a half cents a gallon or something, and the farmers would come in with their 55-gallon drums and load up because it was cheaper to buy it through him than it would be to, to buy it wholesale through their distributor. Didn't happen very much, but it, it did happen on occasion. And the oil wasn't in, in cans and plastic like it is now. It was in bulk, and you had a pump that you'd pump it into bottles and then you'd put it into your 
car from there. Everything was manual. But, uh, things were a little slower in those days. They weren't all that fast and furious like the life that we go through today. Um, now you said the, uh, the school was torn down because it wasn't earthquake safe. Um, Mount Dixon never had a big quake, did it? There was one over by Winters. My, in fact, my mother had a copy of the Dixon Tribune back in 1870s, and I had it, and I, I don't know where it is now, but uh, it, it described the, the rumble they had over in, uh, in Winters. Quite a shocker because anything would make headlines in the local papers in those days. But, but uh, I, I remember they had a special issue on about the earthquake over the winters. So maybe that's what prompted it. I don't know. That's a hundred years ago. So I, it would have to be politics, I would think. Well, what, what about politics? Uh, I guess there's, uh, I guess what you call a uh, leading citizen of Dixon. Were, were they members of some of the more prominent families? How did it work? Oh yeah, there, there were bankers and the doctors and the attorneys, Mr. Royer, banker, Mr. Madden, his father was a, was a banker. Um, I say Francis Stolley's father was a doctor and James Parsons followed the doctor. Uh, so they were, you know, they were, I don't know how you would say it, but 400 of Dixon in those days. Carpenters were quite well known. Can't, I can't recall too much more about it. Um, you said that there were there were five garages in, in Dixon. Uh, that, that seems well, that, that seems, seems a lot about, for right? a little car. That, that, you think that's a lot? Yes, it was a lot. For uh, two thousand people, you got five yeah, garages. Yeah, I guess one that's time there was one called De Artney's Garage, and he was mostly blacksmithing. And uh, I had an uncle, a big German uncle, who was a blacksmith. Worked the the forge and the hammers and all that for the Diartney garage. He did mostly farming work with iron, you know. And, uh, Mr. McGimsey had the Ford garage. My father had Marvin's garage. Do yours had a garage. I, I forget who the fifth one was, but there were at one time, I just remember the figures, five garages in our little town, and who needs five garages in a little town? But uh, we had them. We had a lot of storage in our, my dad had a shop in the back, but most of the front of it was stored because people didn't have garages for their cars in those days. Houses were built without a garage. That's kind of an afterthought. Store at PG and E would store their trucks there. An outfit called Almorada, who was drilling for oil and gas all the time, they would have their trucks there. <laughs> so it was, ours was mostly a. No, he did a lot of, lot of mechanical work too. Like used to, people used to rebore their engines. Now they just throw them away and they get a new engine if they need it. But in my dad's case, he had a boring bar and he would rebore the, the engine. They'd use the same old engine, just put oversized pistons and stuff in it. Times have changed. They said you were cleaning spark plugs. I don't think they do that anymore either. Nobody can spark plugs. Well, I, I can valves. remember that. Even, even I can. Yeah. They had an AC spark plug spark plug cleaner, it was a sandblasting deal, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, 
valve grinding machine. I get to grind the valve, change the plug, and all the trivial stuff. Wash and wax the cars. That was that was my big suit. I still wash and wax the cars. <laughs> well, this tape recorder is about to run out. Let me let me turn it over here. Okay, that's that's fixed. Let's see. We were we we're talking about the business. Um, now, what about uh, the depression? Now it hit in officially in, in 29 but but did that hurt your father's business to did, did uh, fix it 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 must have people couldn't pay their bills they'd have to bring in a dozen eggs to pay for a job of some kind you know every not everything but a lot of it was barter um, we had a lady at one time had a little Chevrolet coupe my dad did some work on it she couldn't pay and he knew she couldn't pay so she would come in and clean our house. My mother would work at the garage doing the book work, so I'd left the house there, and so this lady would come and clean our house once a week or twice a week, whatever, and uh, paid off the, the garage bill that way. And so I imagine that a lot of that took place. I'm not aware of all of it, but I do happen to know that, that one incident. Because the little lady that did that moved to Sacramento and turned out to be a good friend of mine up here and she would tell us that she was so poor and she had two daughters to raise and that she would be happy to come and clean our house. Fifty years or sixty or seventy years later she was telling us what she did when she was young to pay for her car repairs. Uh, but as far as the Everybody was poor. Who who knew? You know, it's, it's a way of life. Uh, we had seemed like we had enough to eat. I never went hungry. My sister and I both had clothes and shoes. Never went barefooted or except by choice. So uh, we seemed to make out all right. Well, uh, jumping around in history. Uh, you were born in 1919, of course, into World War One. Uh, so you didn't experience that, of course. But no. you, you said your father was there. In he, the war? he went. Uh, he was in France for six months. I guess they didn't do a long tour of duty at that time, and he was there for six months. Were there but I don't. He never talked about it. I don't remember uh, any incident other than he was a mechanic when he went over there. And so he worked in the motor pool as a mechanic when he got over there. So he just did the same thing only on army trucks instead of cars. But you know. well, there must have been uh, a few uh, from Dixon who served in the war. Oh, I'm sure there was a lot of them, yes. Uh, same way with the World War Two. You know, they're going to get you no matter what if you happen to be the right age. Uh, well, I asked you about uh, earthquakes. Uh, what about fires? Do you have any? Are they big disasters or fires? I don't recall any no? disasters at all uh -huh. over there. Maybe I had my head in the sand. I don't know, but I just don't remember any any earth shaking stuff. Uh, using the term loosely, I don't even remember earthquakes. My mother remembers seeing the big earthquake down in San Francisco. She could see the smoke from Dixon to San Francisco coming out of the, wow. the fire down there. It was that, that bad. She's men mentioned that a few times. Yeah. But, um, well, well, I guess your head was in, your head was in music. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, music and, and the fact that I could type when I took typing in high school, little did I realize that it was going to be a a lifesaver for me as far as being in the service. When I hit the Marine Corps in November of 1941, I was able to type, and so 
so they pulled me out of the platoon and uh, two other recruits and I got to type and type and type and type because everybody was coming into the Marine Corps in 1942 and 43 and I just typed around the clock for a couple of years. So I guess I can count my blessings to that extent that uh, my typing kept me out of Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima and all those bad places. How you learned your typing at good old Dixon High School? I, yeah, I took two years there. And that's what Was that unusual uh, for a... Uh, I don't know. I get an idea that, uh, well, the girls would learn typing and the boys would learn, I don't know, auto shop or I, carpentry. I, I guess the fact that my fingers were fairly limber from, from playing the piano, that it came fairly easy uh -huh. on the typewriter. And so I can thank my lucky stars that all this stuff came together like it did for me. Yeah, it's interesting. Things fall together like that. Yeah. I did my fair share of typing during the Second War, I know that. But, uh, now, now, what about music? Now, the music, well, you know, every every generation has their own kind of music. Style. Yeah. Well, luckily, the, the big band style is, is the kind of music that I grew up with, and uh, Everybody says it's coming back. We're having a resurgence. The young people are enjoying the big band sound. Well, the the, the rock stuff and the acid rock and the hard rock is what drove us musicians out of business, you know, the big band stuff. Uh, hopefully it's coming back. We, all these years we keep hearing it's coming back, it's coming back, and our work is getting less and less and less. So too bad because that's, that's a, it's not the only kind of music. Every music has this good and bad side to it. But, uh, it's uh, the music I grew up with and to me it'll always be the good music and a lot of other people feel the same way about us. But we're all getting older, that's the thing. Well, I still say the Beatles is the best music around. I see. <laughs> Now that that's a generation thing. Yeah, what about your father? How did he feel about the, the big band sound? Uh, oh, my mother welcomed it. My my father is kind of he could care less. He wasn't in the music, you know. But my my mother condoned it. She, in fact, when they added a little room on our our house uh, over in Dixon, uh, um, it was finished in knotty pine, and he was a a cabinet built for my drums because I was playing drums at the time. You know, a cabinet just built for for the drums <laughs> in my room. And I had my own entrance so that I could come and go to dance jobs and get in late and wouldn't bother them. So, yeah, she was all for it. I remember when we used to play at the, at the Legion Hall over in Dixon there had been a lot of times that she wanted to hear the band, so she'd come and sit on the side and listen to the music and be so proud of her son. But I, I still enjoy it after all these years. I say I started in 1935, and I'm still playing occasionally, not nearly as much as you'd like to, but it's, it's nice to have people that, that are around that still appreciate it the style. Well, I was talking to Vernon last night. He, he said your uh, your band uh, playing up in Lake Tahoe and resorts up there. Oh, yeah, we were up at Kyber's uh, for two summers, uh, and it was a little it was a little quartet type thing, you know. But uh, it, wait, was that directly after high school or after the war? Uh, no, after high school, before the war. Uh -huh. uh, so it was in the, the late thirties. 38, 39, I think. 1938. That's a whole lifetime ago when we stopped to look at it. Well, that wasn't a hobby. That was your profession then. Well, st you're still a student. That was during the student time, you know. Uh, I was going to junior college, too, so. Um, it's uh, A lot of people had a uh, a view of musicians as something 
lesser than the best, you know, because you always hear about the bad guys. You never hear about the good guys. You hear about them smoking marijuana. That used to be real bad in those days. And look at how times have changed. <laughs> this seems to be the thing to do anymore. Is that were musicians doing that? In, in oh, the they 30s? did it back in the 30s. That's what's what started it all. Of course. In those days when they were playing five and six, seven nights a week or something, tremendous pressure and tremendous emotional strain. When you work in a dance job, there's, there's a strain on it. So I guess it'd be kind of a relaxing move. I never used the stuff. I never smoked even cigarettes. I guess the fact that I bought them from my father for so many years kind of spoiled me on it. Yeah, that's what uh, Margaret was telling me, that the dances, the high school dances back then was, uh, I can't think of the right words, uh, but you know, good, clean fun. And there well, wasn't... They didn't have to be chaperones. They had chaperones just because of the Victorian attitude in those days. Like, yeah, But still, they don't have to put up a body search on you, or a weapon search, or you carrying a knife, or something like that at the door. They, don't, they never did that. And drugs and alcohol was not a problem. I don't recall that it was. I think really somebody having a cigarette and a bottle of wine would, or a bottle of beer would be a, a really a daring thing in those days. You go out, and you really either felt great about it or you felt guilty that uh, you might get caught. Uh, even on Halloween, you, uh, Halloween is different now. This trick-or-treating syndrome that these kids go through now, they go blocks out of their way to try to get a bag full of goodies from you. And then you never know if you're going to get them laced with something or not. The whole society anymore is kind of sick. Uh, I don't know, I wake up every day and you wonder, geez, what, what's going to make headlines now? Stuff that makes news now we did never heard of in our day. Yeah, I wonder if it's so, uh, we get more news than we did back then. It's faster, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Faster. Just more people, there's going to be more baddies as well as good guys, so... I Everything is relative, I, I would guess. Good news doesn't sell. It's more interesting to That's have bad the news. Oh, whole truth. Yeah. Sensationalism and bad news. Uh -huh. Seems to be the name of the game anymore. Well, as far as good news and Dixon goes, uh, what, what do you think's the... Talking about the old days, high school days as, as a kid, what were some of your favorite things back then? I guess music is one of them. Yeah, that was my favorite thing, but uh, I just don't recall. And other, it seems there was more sociability involved in the schools than there are now. Uh, you did things uh, not necessarily as a class, but the, the whole student body would enter into something. And, uh, you know, I was kind of lost as charm anymore that uh, everything is so commercialized even on the school level that, uh, just uh, you look back and say well it wasn't so bad in our day you used to feel like you were oppressed because your folks wouldn't let you go out and stay all hours of the day and night but uh, you look back on it it wasn't all that bad and a little correction and a little Not strong arming, but uh, what am I trying to say? Man. Discipline. Discipline. That's you know that's lost anymore. It seems like most of the folks give their kid the twenty dollar bill and tell them to get lost, so they go out and have a good time. I don't know. It's uh, the attitudes uh, have changed so much anymore. 
Um, now, did I hear right that, that, that you worked with uh, the Dixon Tribune? Or what am I thinking of somebody else? Must be somebody else. Must be somebody else. Dean Dunnicliffe's father used to own the Tribune. They were, they were uh, part of the, the, not the big people, but they were the, the more known people. Now that was the only paper in town, of course. It was the only game in town. That's right. Yeah. And uh, he used to—I I used to hear that he'd ride out t to get a news story. Mr. Dunny Cliff, Dean's father, would go out on his bicycle and ride out in the country someplace to verify a story that he'd heard from somebody, and that's how he'd get his news. He was uh, not only the editor and the owner, but he was uh, the reporter and typesetter and all that. Must have been just a few pages each each issue. Oh yeah, six or eight pages I recall. Yeah. But it was interesting. And they had a garden section every week, and the ladies would put in the garden. Then they had the the book review section. And <laughs> it was interesting. But uh, yeah, times change anymore. Everything goes by so fast that. You're in and out of the news before you even are aware of it. Oh, we did have a swimming. I remember they built a swimming pool over in the east part of town years ago, and my cousin's wife was one of the overseers of that. I remember that. The swimming pool. Yeah. I I suppose they still have it. I don't know. It was out. Uh, past the school east of town. I guess that'd be pretty nice to have in these hot summers. Oh yeah, that was, it took them a long time to build it, but uh, it was it was a beautiful installation. That once again was the only game in town too, so every summer the place would be full of kids. They had one little golf course out there, I think it was a nine hole or out by in the area of the swimming pool. I've never played it. I don't play golf, so I, but I do recall that there was a course there. The high school had some nice little tennis courts that we used to play on all the time. And we had the, the big dairy out there east of town. It's, it's headlined as the world's, lar world's largest certified dairy. I remember that. That's long gone too, I suppose. Life goes by so fast, you you wake up someday and here you are almost 80 years old and you say, what's happened? And where has life gone, you know? So busy scratching on a living and taking care of family and the family's up and gone and they have families and... Oh, I, I retired, I worked for 37 plus years for the Rice Growers Association over here on, on the river. And I retired there in uh, 1984. They have subsequently sold the property and the world's largest rice cooperative is down the tubes. They've torn all the buildings down. There's nothing there. If you go over the Pioneer Bridge, you'll see where it was at one time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, my retirement, I'm doing down on my hands and knees, doing the yard work, and my wife still works five hours a day, so I'm the I'm the honeydew person around here. I, oh, I the honeydew person. clean the house. I do the yard work, keep the cars clean. She has to have one to go to work, and I have one, so that's. So you're waxing cars again, then? Huh? You're washing and waxing cars again? Yeah. Nothing changes, <laughs> but I have this 72 Chevelle that I bought new, and it's a collector's item. It's a do-it-yourself collector's job, I find. Yeah, I saw that out of the garage. Yes, it's a beauty. But, uh, so as long as my wife works the five hours a day, she cooks for a daycare center, and so it works good both ways. I don't. 
get under her feet, but she doesn't get under mine. So. Well, as so. far as Dixon goes, I think I've gone down the list of well, subjects to talk about. Is there something we, we should talk about that I forgot? I can't think of it anymore. What, uh, what we should be thinking about is wasn't important at the time. As I explained, you, you just go on and one day at a time and, and then you look back 50 years and try to remember now what's the greatest thing that happened over It's hard to remember, you know, because you're so busy trying to exist even in those days. And most changes are slow and you don't notice yeah. what can happen without mm -hmm. us, you know. Hmm. Okay, well, I guess we got what you covered, got. Uh, <laughs> probably you've heard the same story a hundred times, so... Well, you get a different perspective each yeah, time you hear it, and that's the important thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, on behalf of uh, the Dixon Public Library, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to sit down and, and talk to us. My pleasure. I hope I, you can put it all together that, that you have the big picture, huh? That's right. We'll be talking to a lot more people, and, and, and we'll get the story. <laughs>